It's made up of four chambers with four valves. It's an amazing little pump that recirculates our life-sustaining blood at a rate of 2,000 gallons a day. Not that you're walking around with 2,000 gallons of blood, but that's how much it's recirculating in our bodies. It's just a little larger than your fist. It only weighs 7 to 15 ounces, depending on whether you're male or female and your overall size. It contracts and expands. In other words, heart beats 100,000 times a day. And if you live a normal lifespan, your little heart will beat 3 billion times. What a servant. What a humble, quiet servant lies behind our chest bones. Regarding our physical health, your heart is the heart of the matter. The strongest evidence of this is negative evidence. The number one killer in the United States in 2020 was not COVID, and it was not cancer. It was heart disease. Same as 2019 and 2018 and 2017 and every year before that and every year going forward. In fact, in 2020, 700,000 people died from heart disease. That's 21% of the total of people who died in America. 21%. And that was a 6% increase from the year before. So with all of our advancements in medical technology and all of our advancements in pursuing health and fitness and all of these things, heart disease increased from, ni- from 2019 to 2020 by 6%. I say all that to say because there is a great parallel here for us to our immaterial or our spiritual hearts. Our spiritual heart is also the heart and soul of the matter when it comes to spiritual health. It's all about the heart. It doesn't have four chambers. It actually kind of has three, the spiritual heart. It's triad in nature. Your spiritual heart is made up of your mind, your feelings, and your will also known as your intellectual aspect, your emotional, and your volitional. You put these three together, and they're a complex blend, and that equates to the spiritual heart of man. Now, this also includes your deepest convictions. It includes your strongest held sincere beliefs. It also includes your moral compass or what the Bible would refer to as our conscience. All of these things go together to make up the spiritual heart of man. Kyle and Delich are some famous Old Testament commentators from Germany, and uh, they took it their ordinary deep dive into defining and explaining the spiritual heart. Here's what they said. They said, the heart is the instrument of the thinking, willing, perceiving life of the spirit. The heart is the seat of knowledge of self and the seat of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of our relation to God and also of the law of God impressed on our moral nature. The heart is the workshop of our individual spiritual and ethical life. So once again, I say it is the human heart that is, spiritually speaking, the heart of the matter concerning our spiritual health. Now, as believers, you and I have new hearts. We have been given a new, good, living heart. As believers, and it was referred to in our reading this morning, by means of God the Holy Spirit, God took out a heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. He took out something that was dead and lifeless and cold and hard, and He gave us something that was warm and alive and soft and impressionable, where He could write His law upon our hearts. This is one of the aspects of the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, distinct from the Old Covenant, God, by the Holy Spirit, has written His law on your spiritual heart. And so as believers, we have a new heart. Praise God. This is a great, great gift to us. This new heart then is, once again, triad in nature. We have a new mind. As believers, we have the mind of Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We do. And we can think new thoughts with our new mind. We also have new affections. 
or new feelings as believers. With our gift of a new heart, we now love things we used to hate, and we now pursue things we used to ignore, and we now hate things we used to love, and we now ignore things we used to pursue. All because God has given us this new heart with a new mind and new affections. And we also have a new will. Or we might say a will that has been freed. Your will as a believer has been released now from bondage. Before regeneration, before the new birth, your will was bound to your sinful nature. And all it could choose would be various choices among sin. That's all we could do. We were slaves to sin, the Bible says. We were dead in sins, the Bible says. And so our will was bound to our sinful nature. As a dog cannot, uh, you know, quack like a duck or fly across a pond, neither could we, in our sinful state, obey God. It was impossible. We couldn't glorify God. We couldn't please God because our sin nature had bound up our wills. But now you have a free will. Now your will is something akin to what Adam had before the fall, where it has been released, and you're no longer bound to your sin nature. But now, believer, you and I have the ability, the capability to actually obey God from where? The heart. Not wrote, not dead religion, not just going through the motions, but we have now the ability to obey God from the heart. So that now when we sin as believers, we are making a willing choice. We are making a choice to sin because we have the ability not to sin as believers. And sin, I want to remind you, and temptation, when temptation comes and and, and whether sin will follow or not, is not a foregone conclusion. It's not an inevitable result. You are a new creature in Christ. And you have a new heart that can obey God joyfully and willingly and consistently. Now, because of our fallen, uh, unredeemed flesh, of course, we will never obey God perfectly in this life. But we have the ability to say yes to God and no to sin. This is really the life of sanctification. And it's really part of the gospel message. Right? Not only did Jesus die to pay for our sins and give us the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of our sins, but Jesus died to set us free from the power of sin. This is part of the gospel. This is part of the good news. If we're not set free that we have the ability to, to obey God and please Him, then what kind of good news is this? Right? Just as, in fact, our glorification is part of the good news. One day we'll be free from the presence of sin. Okay? So in the gospel, we're set free from the penalty of sin by the death of Christ. We're set free from the power of sin by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And one day we'll be set free from the presence of sin when we're glorified. And we have our new bodies and we're redeemed. This is the full-orbed gospel of the Bible. Praise be to Jesus. He saves us from first to last. Christian, you are a new person in Christ, and you have a new heart, and you are able to please God as you journey home from the city of destruction to the celestial city. But it is through many dangers, toils, and snares that we must travel. It is through many dangers, toils, and snares, dangers to our spiritual hearts that we must travel, and these threats, uh, these toils and snares threaten the health of our spiritual beings. That brings us back to a verse we ended with last week that I just could not leave alone. I wanted to come back to it for an entire sermon, and that is Proverbs 4.23. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible, certainly high on the list of probably top five in all the book of Proverbs, which I just love uh, by itself, but it's Proverbs 4.23, and we ended with it last week as the one solution to all of those idols of the heart. If you were here with us, you will remember There was one solution to those seven idols of the heart, and here it is. It's Proverbs 4.23, and I beg you to memorize it. I beg you this week, if you haven't already, to commit this one verse to memory and then chew on it and chew on it and chew on it. It goes like this. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Proverbs 4, 
23. Now let's plug in our definition of the heart into this verse so that it begins to really get into our minds. Watch over your mind, emotions, and will with all diligence, for from these flow the springs of life. Watch over your thoughts, your feelings, and your choices with all diligence, for from these flow the springs of life. Believer, watch over your conscience, your beliefs, your affections, and your decisions with all diligence, for from these will flow the springs of life. Now, from Proverbs 4.23, I want to ask and answer four questions, four very basic, simple questions from this verse. Number one, what does it mean to watch over your heart? Number two, who must watch over your heart? Number three, why must we watch over, or why must you watch over your heart? And number four, how do you watch over your heart? So we begin with number one, what does it mean to watch over your heart? Think of something that you have in this life that is a possession, something of a material possession, and, and think about how you would want to guard it. Uh, in fact, several translations say guard your heart with all diligence. So it has that idea of, of a sentry, standing guard, watching over. I mean, I just have a visual in my mind right now of our Supreme Court and the fence out front and the, and the policeman or whoever they have out there uh, that were standing guard protecting, right? That's an aspect of this watching over your heart for sure. It's, it's like you would protect your social security number. I hope you're not going around, you know, saying it out loud in a public place. You don't leave your wallet lying around at a, at a restaurant, right, on purpose. You don't, you don't get out your social security card and just leave it on a park bench somewhere, right? You guard it. You watch over your social security number. You value it. You want to protect it. I think of a new mom with a toddler, maybe a four-year-old, maybe a five-year-old in a busy parking lot, and how will that new mom watch over that child? Protecting, guarding, holding that hand tightly, or even carrying that child through such a place. The idea of watching over your heart means to shade your heart. Uh, you think of how valuable shade is right now, how, how awesome it is to have trees with the leaves on them, <laughs> shading our person, our homes, or, or you think of a shield, uh, when you think about watching over your heart, you want to shield your heart, protect your heart, shade your heart, guard your heart. We're talking about staying attentive then all the time to the well-being of your spiritual heart. And this requires 24-7, 365 vigilance and diligence. <laughs> But I want to say this, it goes beyond just guarding or protecting. It goes beyond a sentry standing on duty. It goes beyond just this raw idea of this is something valuable and I'm going to, I'm going to defend it. Guarding our hearts actually involves also caring for them. Again, the spiritual parallels are great. It involves doing positive things beyond just defense. Uh, Here's an example. It might be how we would care for our lawns or care for a patio plant. I've got one, two, three, four patio plants. They're all different kinds of plants. They're different sizes. They're different pots around our screened-in porch in our backyard. And so guarding them, protecting them, watching over them involves keeping an eye on them, right? I, I got to look at them. I got to see which one needs water, which one needs food. Every once in a while, I'll go out there with a fork and I'll, I'll dig up the dirt and loosen it up and get some oxygen down in the dirt. And, and every once in a while, the dirt disappears, right? Because the plant's eating the dirt, right? And so the plant needs some food. It needs water. It needs sunlight. I move them around so that the sun hits some of them more than the other. So this is all an illustration of what it means to watch over your heart. It's not just I've got these, these plants in a screened-in porch and the deer can't come eat them. That's not enough, is it? That is not enough. If that's all I did, they would die. They would shrivel up and die. They must be cared for. They must be watered. They must be paid attention to. That's what it means then to watch over your heart, to watch over your heart. Does your heart need food? Does it need some sunlight? Does it need a fork digging up the hard dirt? Does it, does it need some water poured on it? Does it need to be pruned a little bit? Are there some dead 
leaves on there, some dead branches that need to be snipped off? Do I need to reposition it? Do I need to move it around somewhere? You know, it's getting in a rut here in this one place all the time. You've got to watch over your heart like you would a flower garden or a plant. All right, number two question is, who must guard your heart? And the answer to the question is in the question, right? And I can't overemphasize this enough. I just can't. You must watch over your heart. If you don't hear anything today, this is what I want you to hear. No one can do this for you. I cannot watch over your heart, nor am I charged to. Nowhere in the Bible does it say pastors are to, in these kinds of words, are to watch over your heart. And you don't have the burden of watching over my heart. What an impossible burden that would be for me to have that of you or you of me. You don't, and I don't. Here is the reality you and only you have the personal responsibility and the personal obligation to watch over your inner man and to care for your own soul. Now, other people will encourage or discourage that. They'll come alongside and enhance that and, and be part of the body of Christ, of course, of course, of course. But at the end of the day, you must watch over your thought life. I can't. Mine is enough work by itself, trust me. At the end of the day, you must watch over your feelings. You must rein them in, get them under control, aim them in the right direction. That is your job and your job alone. You, you must make good decisions. You must do this. And you alone. Now, this is like owning a house pet, particularly a dog. Now, think about this. We have a little dog at home, and I, Kim was out of town for the last week, and so I had the full 100% responsibility <laughs> to sustain this little dog's life. And, and everything about this dog's happiness and health depended 100%, humanly speaking, on me and only me, right? Now, think about your little dog at home, or maybe it's a big dog at home that lives in your house. I mean, that dog cannot walk to the cabinet and open it up and open that, find that can and, and open it and feed itself, can it? Can't water itself? Can't, it can't let itself outside? It's completely helpless and 100% dependent on you. It is. What an illustration of our own hearts. You know, if that dog lives, it's because you fed it. It's because you gave it water. If that heart lives, humanly speaking, it's because you tended to its needs. Because it, 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 can't, it can't sustain itself without you tending to it. Now, here's another illustration. It's like driving, I think. I was driving to the airport Saturday, and I was thinking about my sermon, and, and this came to mind. You know, other people inside your car can support your good driving. They can support you watching over the road with all diligence, or they can distract you. They can uh, pull away from that, right? Other passengers can be positive or negative influences on whether you watch over the road with all diligence when you're driving. But you have the will, they can help or not help. They can go to sleep. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, you must watch over the road with all diligence because you have the will. And to me, that is a, a real illustration of what I'm trying to say here by who must watch over your heart. You're driving. You're driving your, your car. You're driving your life. You've got the will of your life, ultimately, humanly speaking. And you want to surround yourself with people who will support you watching the road? who will help you be a good driver, but you must ultimately be the one who does it. No one can guard your heart then but you. Number three, why must we watch over our hearts? Why must we watch over our hearts? Well, right from the verse itself, the New American Standard says, for from it flow the springs of life. NIV says, for everything you do flows from it. The New Living Translation says, for it, your heart determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the course of your life. Here's the reality. What flows from your heart, for from it flow the springs of life. What that verse is getting at is everything that comes out of your heart, every, every thought, every feeling, every choice, every word, every behavior, everything that that's continuously coming out of your inner, most deepest self, touches everything and everyone around you, right? 
You agree? <laughs> what comes out of us affects and impacts and influences everyone in our world and also circles back to affect us. This is what's really interesting about this passage to me is because, you know, it's from, the, it's from within, it's from the heart that the mouth speaks, right? It is from the heart that the mouth speaks and yet as words go out of our mouth, not only do they affect everyone who hears them, but the reality of the human existence is they circle back and they affect our hearts. They came from the heart, they came out of the mouth, but then they come back to do something to our hearts, whether negative or positive. That's what this verse is getting at. Why must we watch over our hearts with all diligence? Because everything you do comes from your heart and returns to your heart and touches everyone around you. No one is an island unto themselves. You might think, oh, I just live my life in, in, in loneliness or, or aloneness and what I do doesn't affect others. Well, you know what? There's, there's what you're not doing is affecting others. And what you do when you are with people affects them as well. Here's an illustration that will be very close to home. Uh, hundreds of feet straight down from where we are right now, hundreds of feet, maybe even thousands, is what's known as the Trinity Aquifer. The Trinity Aquifer. Also, the aquifer in this area is the Edwards Aquifer, and there's some uh, combination of the two. Now, this lies, obviously, as we sit here right now, it lies out of sight to us. It's way, way, way down deep in the ground, and it's out of sight until it bubbles up to the surface out from rocks in what we call springs. And those springs in our great state of Texas create most of our life-giving, life-sustaining rivers, right? It all starts way down deep in the heart way down deep in the aquifer. And that bubbles up and brings life, or it doesn't bubble up and bring life. Our aquifers are so important that Kerr County by itself has five different monitoring wells, five different wells strategically placed throughout the county that they drill just to monitor our aquifers just to monitor the quality and quantity of the water down below us, to keep an eye on them, to watch over them closely with all diligence. These monitoring wells are critical to our physical life and well-being. God forbid if something were to happen where somehow someone could poison the aquifer, right? Somehow someone could get something down there that would ruin that water, God forbid, we must, you know, be diligent to protect against such a thing. But the bigger threat, of course, is what we're experiencing right now. The bigger threat is a drought. The bigger threat is when those aquifers begin to drop in volume of water and drop and drop because we're drawing and drawing and drawing and the springs begin to diminish and the river flow begins to diminish. And so these monitoring wells are primarily for that purpose, right? Right? They're primarily about the quantity of water beneath us. And when that begins to decrease, preventive measures must be taken. They must be taken. We must watch over these aquifers with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And that is an illustration of your heart to a T. If that aquifer is drained dry, the only way that it is recharged is by rain from the heavens. And it is the same with our hearts. If we just give and give and give and give, if they're drained dry, if they're pumped dry, if we don't sink down some monitoring wells and keep a close eye on them, and then lo and behold, they either get poisoned or they get dried up, lo and behold, the only solution is rain from the heavens. The rain of God's grace, the rain of God's word, the rain of God's presence replenishing, recharging, renewing the heart. This is why you must watch over your hearts. This is a good time in the sermon then to just pause and to ask of you some heart-probing questions. 
How's your heart? How's your heart? What I'm asking is, how are you really doing? What occupies and dominates your thoughts? What occupies and dominates your thought life? How do you feel about God? How do you feel about Jesus, about yourself, about life, about other people around you? What daily choices are you making? So we can talk about, you know, the will and the volition and all these things and get into all kinds of deep theological discussions about those, and those are wonderful. But what we're really talking about when we're talking about the volition is Let's get practical. What are the daily choices that we make? And, and am I building godly habits with my daily choices? Or am I building worldly habits, ungodly habits? You, you can drop a monitoring well into the health of your will by looking at your decisions, your choices, your behavior. So how's your heart? Are you taking time to download your heart before the Lord? This is where it all starts. If we're going to have a healthy heart, if we're going to really monitor what's going on there, we need to have daily, periodic, regular times where we, we download on the Lord. Where we, as the psalmist would say, pour out our hearts before Him. Right? As the psalmist would say, we... We divulge the deepest feelings and secrets and beliefs and fears and worries. We, we unload those on the Lord. This is what it means to have a relationship with the Lord. Okay? This is what it means that the Lord is a person who knows you, who is with you, who loves you. This is not a, a religion of just keeping a bunch of rules and doing certain things and not doing other things. This is a relationship where you can talk to the living God of the universe and download your spiritual baggage, and download your spiritual hurts, your fears, your worries. Tell it to the Lord in prayer. This is so critical to heart healthiness. Now, we also are connected to one another. We have a vertical relationship. We have a horizontal relationship. So the next question is, do you have someone in your life with whom you can discuss your heart? Do you have a spiritual cardiologist? Do you have someone that you can sit down with safely, freely, and say, this is what's going on in my heart? And this other person can hear that and receive that and do the same. This is critical to heart healthiness. Otherwise, we just become more and more shells and distant and removed from realities of life. That brings us to our fourth and final question. How do you watch over your heart? How do you watch over your heart? Now, this is like answering, how do you walk across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope? <laughs> what would be the answer? Very carefully. <laughs> So how do we watch over our hearts? Very carefully. The text tells us initially, NIV, above all else. The New American Standard, with all diligence. Other translations say vigilance. Love those words. It's just calling for a constant attention as we've been speaking of. Uh, that's why we have these five monitoring wells. So they can give constant attention, not periodic attention. But I want to ask the question, is there more to this answer Number four, how do you watch over your heart? Is there more from the surrounding context of our verse that might clue us in to some practical supports? And there is. So the context of our verse is 20 to 27. <clears throat> and I'm going to read all of them as we go along now here for the rest of the sermon. <clears throat> because if you find Proverbs 4.23, you see that it is nested and embedded in this paragraph. Even in the Proverbs, it's a paragraph from 20 to 27. Now, these are not going to be steps that we take to guard our hearts. It's not like that. It's not mechanical. It's more like supportive, holistic actions that come alongside and help you guard your heart, help you watch over your heart. 
Uh, these would be like some good passengers in the car, you know, that if they see you swerve or they notice you dozing off or what, they're there to help you watch the road. And that's what these are. And there's four of them that I want to give you now as we answer this fourth question, how do we watch over our hearts with all diligence? The first one comes in verses 20 to 22, and it's this, saturate your heart with Scripture. How do you watch over your heart? Saturate your heart or soak your heart with Scripture. Let's read verses 20 to 22. My son, it's Solomon writing to his teenage son primarily. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Wow. Now back in verse 4 of this same chapter, I believe it was verse 4. Yes. Then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. And so he comes back to the heart now in our last in this last section of this paragraph. So the first way that we can watch over our hearts, the most important way that we watch over our hearts and guard them is to saturate them with the Word of God, to pour the Bible into your heart. My son, give attention, pay attention to my words and incline your ear to my sayings. We need to pay frequent attention then to the very words of Scripture and to the sayings of Scripture. These need to become our words and our sayings of life. Matthew Henry said it beautifully. He said, the attentive hearing of the Word of God is a good sign of a work of grace begun in the heart and a good means of carrying it on. The attentive hearing of the Word of God. So we we, we got to soak our hearts in the Scriptures. How do we do that? Well, there's five ways you do that. You do that by, by hearing, by reading, by study, by memorizing, and by meditating. And you put those five together and you can get a grip on your Bible. Like the five fingers of your hand with the thumb being the most important, which is meditating on the Word of God, you have a grip on your Bible. We must hear it, read it, study it, memorize it, and meditate on it. This is how we soak our hearts with Scripture. It's not rocket science. A child can do it. It's so so very basic and easy. You need to see the Bible with your eyes. You need to hear yourself read it to yourself out loud. You need to get it into your minds, and it takes time and it takes effort. We need to commit Bible words and Bible sayings to memory. We get them in our memory, and then we chew the cud. Once you get them in there deposited, then no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, you can chew the cud. You can meditate on it. You can mull it over, turn it over in your mind over and over and over again. This is what it means to saturate your heart with Scripture. You're saturating your thoughts, your feelings, and your will with Scripture. Okay, And I, I want to encourage you to go deeper in this process and not wider. This is something I've been convicted about recently in my own Bible intake, is I need to go deeper and not just wider. Sometimes we're just skipping a stone across the pond instead of you know a deep sea dive. The deep sea dive is way better, way, way better. You're after quality, not quantity. Because you're trying to saturate your thoughts, your feelings, and your will with the Word of God. Now, we walk outside when we're done here today, and we look around and we answer this question very easily. What does our land need right now? What does it need right now? You know, we need rain, but we don't, we don't need, I mean, we'd take it. We'd take whatever we get, we, but we don't like, ideally, we don't need like a torrential downpour all at once, right? On this hardened ground, so much of that's going to run off, right? And we don't need, you know, we've had a few of these lately, just this like this little tease of a little sprinkle, you know, like, whoa, is that like a sprinkle on my windshield? You know, we don't need just like the little trace of a rain. What we need is a good, slow, soaking rain, right? We need a soaking rain, and that's what our hearts need. That's what I mean by quality over quantity, Your heart needs a soaking rain every day, not a few sprinkles on the windshield of your life. This is what I mean by saturating or soaking your heart with Scripture. This means we view it and we review it. We hear the sermon and we hear it again. We 
have a constant and close attention to the truths of the Bible. Truths, not trivia truths. Not just so I can impress people theologically or intellectually truths. I'm talking about the truths of the Bible about God, about yourself, and about everyone around you. Those are the truths we need to saturate our hearts and minds with. That's, uh, that's our first way that we will answer number four. The second way is verse 24. So we've, we've got verse 23 is next, right? Watch over your heart. Now we jump down to verse 24. It says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. The second way that we watch over our hearts is we lose the lies. Lose the lies that are getting a foothold in your life. So this is very interesting because lies obviously flow from the heart. But like I said earlier, they also come back around to the heart because lies that come out of the heart further corrupt the heart. They further do damage to the heart because every lie has negative consequences. And those negative consequences eventually find their way back to affect your heart, your conscience, your beliefs, your, your behavior, your feelings, your everything in your deepest, most inner self. Lies are like a heart murmur. A heart murmur happens when there's something wrong with your valve and the blood that's supposed to be going one direction leaks back into a place that it's not supposed to go into your heart. That's a heart murmur. It doesn't sound right. That's what a lie is. A lie is a heart murmur going on in your spiritual life. It's blood leaking back. And when that blood leaks back over time, it starts to do damage to the valve and it starts to do damage to your actual heart. It can actually cause your, for instance, your aorta to get bigger and bigger, an aneurysm. This happens when you got something wrong with the flow in your heart. And so it is with lies. They're not innocent. They're not just temporary. They're not just throwaways. They, they come out from the heart, out of the mouth, and they circle back and they do something to us. They do. Because deception destroys the deceiver and the deceived. It has to. It comes from the devil. And he's the father of lies. And God hates lying. God says this over and over and over again in the Bible. In the, in the, in the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness. God is God of truth. Jesus is the truth. He hates lying lips. It's an abomination to the Lord. We've got to lose the lies if we're going to watch over our hearts. We've got to lose the lie of exaggerating the truth without people obviously knowing you're exaggerating, you know, in, in a humorous way. We've got to lose the lie of flattery and its opposite, slander. We've got to lose the lie of subtle gossip, of cheating in school, of lying on tax returns. Those are all an abomination to the Lord. Hiding what you should confess is lying. Telling a half-truth when the moral obligation is to tell the whole truth is lying. Repeating something you don't know 100% certain is a fact is lying. This is why spreading conspiracy theories that you don't know 100% certain, like you know this 100% certain and you spread those, that's lying. It needs to stop. It's not helpful to anybody, especially, especially your own heart. We need to be people of the truth. That's the second way that we will watch over our hearts with all diligence, is we've got to lose the lies. The third way is verse 25. Get focused. <laughs> you, you, I can't say that without doing this, right? <laughs> you can't, like, get focused. This is verse 25. Look at it. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Get focused. This is part of a supportive action that's going to help us to guard our hearts. Verse 25 is calling us to self-control over our gaze, over our eye gate. We must ignore distractions and deceptions of this world that would pull our mind away from God's thoughts and God's truth. And so I ask you today, you need to do this. You need to evaluate what causes your focus to suffer and do something about it. 
so that you can look straight ahead and your gaze can be fixed, fixed on the target, on the goal. What distracts you from looking straight ahead? What distracts you in your life from getting off course? You got to figure out what that is because you got to know yourself and you got to do something about it. See, the opposite of verse 25, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. The opposite of that is to pursue the trivial, the inconsequential, and the frivolous. The opposite of verse 25 is wasted motion, wasted money, wasted time, and wasted words, which all add up to what? A wasted life because you weren't fixed straight in front of you. Get focused. If we have a purposeless, insatiable gazing from one thing to the next, oh, look at that, look at that, oh my goodness, did you see that? If we have this insatiable gazing from one trinket uh, to the next, from one allurement to the next, that will have a negative impact on our souls. It will. It will weaken our spiritual vitality, and it will begin to defile our thoughts. In fact, I think it will also begin to depress our thoughts. You know, the thousand-yard stare, that, that's, just, that's not a good thing. The thousand-yard stare will inevitably bring defilement and depression to your thoughts. Now, get, fi- get focused and get fixed on the target, on the goal. I've been quoting from Matthew Henry this week and last week. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. He lived from 1662 to 1714. That was a long time ago. I don't feel like he had as many distractions as we do. I know he didn't have a smartphone. Matthew Henry was a nonconformist minister. In other words, a Puritan minister. Nonconformist like John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He's of that same ilk. He was an author. He was born in Wales, but he spent much of his life in England. And he's best known for a six-volume commentary on the entire Bible. And here's what he said about this one verse. Let the eye be fixed and not wandering. Let it not rove after everything that presents itself, for then it will be diverted from good and ensnared in evil. Turn it from beholding vanity. Let your eye be single and not divided. Let your intentions be sincere and uniform. We must keep our eye on our master and be careful to please him. We must keep our eye upon our rule and conform to that. We must keep our eye upon our mark the prize of the high calling, and direct everything towards that. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. So number one, we must saturate our hearts with Scripture. Number two, lose the lies. Number three, get focused. Get focused. And then finally, number four is verses 26 and 27. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. I call this one, hey, watch where you're going. (laughs) Number four is, hey, watch where you're going. This is how you will support the activity of guarding your heart. So you're walking through life. Verses 26 and 27 is talking about behaviors, talking about choices, talking about decisions. You're walking through life, and we face hundreds of them every single day. And he's saying to us, is that really the path? He's saying to us in these verses, is that the narrow road that leads to life? Or is that the wide path that leads to destruction? Hey! Hey! Watch where you're going. Jesus said, He is the way. Does that look like Jesus to you? What does He say? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. Way means path. means road. Does that road look like Jesus? If it doesn't, don't walk down it. Ask yourself before you take the very next step. Will this decision edify? Will this glorify God? Say to yourself, self, you've walked this path before. You know where this ends. 
You know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting what? A different outcome. That's the definition of insanity. Say to yourself, self, you've been down this road. You know it's a dead end. You know these weeds are going to get you full of chiggers, (laughs) ant bites, poison ivy. You know it. Don't go down there. Get back on the path. Watch where you're going. Watch where you're going. There are so many unwise and worldly detours that call our, for our attention. And what they will inevitably do, every single one of them, is they will take you away from the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. Every one of them will. They'll take you away from God's wisdom into the world's wisdom, which is foolishness. Every one of these detours and these distractions and these devious paths will take us away from a life of daily discipline to a life of spiritual laziness. They will pull us from kindness to rudeness. They will pull us from humility to pride, from the fear of God to the fear of man. Watch the path of your feet. Watch all of your ways. So that, so that all your ways could be established, do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn your foot from evil. Well, it turns out that guarding your heart involves your whole life and your whole body. Did you notice? Our ears listen to God's Word. Our eyes are to gaze upon Scripture and things that are good and right and true and noble and lovely and not upon what tempts us to sin. And our mouth must speak goodness and truth to others, and our feet must walk the path of holiness and righteousness. And all of these are actions that support the central core action of verse 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Some of you are familiar with Wayne Grudem. He taught seminary for decades, and he's written many, many books, among them a great systematic theology that we've used many times in this church. And Wayne Grudem is a, 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 quite the scholar of the Bible. Wayne Grudem was on the committee that did the translation for the ESV, the English Standard Version. And he tells a story on himself preaching a sermon on Proverbs 4.23. And the story goes something like this. He was on this uh, committee work, this translation committee of some 10, 15 uh, godly biblical scholars who are working on a translation of the Bible, right? I mean, get this picture now. They're, they're working on the Bible from the original languages of Hebrew and Greek, and they're together for 8, 10, 12 hours a day working through this. And things are going wonderfully well and everyone's in a spiritual frame of mind and they're just enjoying each other's company and the work that God had given them to create this really sound, really good translation of the Bible called the ESV. Well, Wayne Grimm tells the story that as the days went on, the hours got longer and longer and he began to sleep in a little bit more each morning. Because it was tired and they would do this all this grueling work, mentally draining work. They do this for 10 or 12 hours. And then, of course, there's conversations about it afterwards. And they're staying up till 10 or 11 or night, more of the same. And so he would begin to hit the snooze and hit the, oh, just sleep in 15 minutes. So what inevitably got squeezed from his life was his quiet time, his time alone with the Lord. He said this went on for three or four days. And he's saying, oh, it's fine. I'm with godly people. We're translating the Bible. <laughs> It's okay. I can set this aside for now. And this goes on for three or four days, and then he begins to notice something is wrong. And his wife is with him on this uh, trip. They're out of town. They're not at home. His wife is with him, and she begins to notice that something is wrong. And so one day, he gets up early enough to do this. He gets out his journal, and he begins to do some heart monitoring. And he wrote this in his journal. He said, here are the results of missing my devotion during translation of the Bible. (laughs) Number one, talking about myself a lot. Number two, inwardly hoping that others will praise me. Three, lack of love toward my friends. Four, irritable. Five, a sense of unease, unsettled, hard to concentrate. Six, self-reliant and no peace. 
What happened? By his own admission, he said, I failed to watch over my heart. Let's pray. Father, there's not a person here that can't relate to this list. And it is certainly an eye-opener for me and a call to what this verse gives us, Lord. Thank you for Proverbs 4.23. And I pray, first of all, that you would enable every believer in the hearing of my voice to commit this verse to memory and to meditate on it. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us by your grace and for the glory of Christ to do exactly what it says, to do so daily, to do so consistently, to do so in a, in a fashion that is better and better than wherever we are right now. Because wherever we are right now, we can go forward. We can do better because you've given us a new heart to watch over. So thank you for this uh, priceless gift for every believer of a new heart. Lord, for those who are with us today that don't have a new heart, whose heart is still a heart of stone, who are still far from you. We pray that you would show this to them and that their eyes would be open to their need for Jesus and their need for the new birth even, to be born again so that they might uh, know you, love you, serve you, and be with you forever one day. We ask uh, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.